Good morning. And good morning everybody joining from here and from afar. And welcome to Breakthrough City Church and yeah, we are thankful for this morning. So today I'm going to be sharing a word and uh, I'm actually going to be adding on what the pastor has been talking about. The pastor has been talking a lot about reformation. So this morning I'm going to be talking about reformation without actually taking anything from what he's been talking about. So uh, one day I was reminded that we we describe ourselves as a, a governing church uh, because a governing church is a church that actually carries the stature in the spirit to govern and to, to pioneer things. So I was actually reminded that uh, if, we, if we see we are a governing church, we should actually be at the forefront of reformation of the society. And uh, we've actually been talking about uh, the seven mountains, how God wants to invade those seven mountains that we've been talking about, your family, your business. And so this morning, I just want to share some of the, the aspects of how reformation looks like. And uh, just to start with, uh, there's a scripture in Psalm 24, but we're actually going to read Isaiah 58. But Psalm 24, verse 1, it actually says, if I can just read it in passing, it says, The earth is the Lord and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in. Okay, so we, we know that David knew, actually, he lived in the New Testament while he was actually in the old. So what he meant we, when he says that the earth belongs to the Lord, it's, it's actually saying all the laws, the governments, the education system, all of these things, they belong to God and they should please the Lord. Okay. And, and when we come to the New Testament, we, we see Jesus saying uh, in Matthew 4, verse 17, it's, it's actually, uh, there's a, a well-known scripture that we talk about a lot where he's saying, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay. So what he means, uh, the kingdom, the kingdom, it actually refers to the sovereign presence and authority of God invading and impacting the earthly environment. Was telling the disciples, repent for the kingdom is at hand. And afterwards, he, he calls the four fishermen as the disciples. So he calls them from the marketplace. He didn't call them from, from the church. So he started actually his ministry in the marketplace, which shows us that uh, his ministry was actually focusing on reforming the society out there, not necessarily limiting it to the four walls of the church. So, uh, but we, we actually need to understand uh, what are some of those keys of uh, reformation. And one of the truths that we need to know is that Jesus reformed the church first before the, he actually said we should go reform our way. So, the foundation of the church is the apostolic and, and the prophetic. And this truth was or has been restored. I think it is in the 19, 1950s and 1960s. Okay. So Ephesians 2.20 says, uh, the church is built on the foundation of the apostolic and the prophetic. That's how we're going to build the church. So before we do the reformation, it means the church first. It has actually been reformed into the present truth. And uh, the whole issue of uh, reformation, it has been... Uh, it was seen by prophet Isaiah. Let's read Isaiah 58, verse 12. So in Isaiah 58, uh, Isaiah is giving us the picture of how the church is going to look like. The same way he prophesied that the Messiah was going to come. He's also showing us how the church is going to look like. So in verse 12, he's saying... Uh, and those from among, among you shall build the old waste places. 
You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the bridge, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. And another translation says, And they, they shall be of you, shall build all old ways, places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer, the, and you shall be the restorer of the path to join in. This is actually the picture of apostolic reformation. Because you will see there that there's old waste places that have been invaded by the enemy. So the church is actually tasked to, to build those old waste places. We raise up the foundations for many generations. When we, what we do right now, it has to be transferred to the next generation so that it creates the momentum where the next generation it builds on something that is actually much better. And the restorer of the path to dwell in. And so if I have to define what the reformation is, I will say reformation is the amendment or repair of what is corrupt. Many of us we talk about the corrupt government. So it's about we repair what is corrupt we build the institutions of our governments and society according to their God-ordained order and organization. Remember, we use the foundations of the apostolic and the prophetic. So but we build, we repair, we build according to the foundations of the apostolic and the prophetic. And uh, some of the aspects is that we, inst we have to institutionalize God's will in how we do our daily life. So wherever you are at work, in your family, we God has to be at the center. We institutionalize it. Uh, how we deal with the poor, how we administer justice, how we teach the children, and how we generally live our lives. So the way the reform is, 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 is made with the prefix of re, which means again, and then we form. And Reform carries the understanding of we improve. Another definition you can say we improve by altering the systems of the society. We improve them. And some way we correct the errors. And some way we will remove the defects and the faults that have been created by demonic powers and principalities. So there's, there's different aspects. Some way we build. Some way we correct. Some way we remove. Some way we correct the faults. It just depends on uh, uh, the situation that we find ourselves in. Another aspect is that we improve in conduct and in character. We all know that uh, character is, is, is actually the big issue in the kingdom of God. God expects us to, to actually carry the godly character. Yeah. Uh, another way of looking at the reformation, it, it means we abolish what is abuse. We or malpractice. We cause people to also abandon irresponsible and immoral practices and we change the systems for, for the better. Okay. And now, who should be at the forefront of reformation? It's actually the, the church. Okay. We as the believers, we should be at the forefront of reformation. But we cannot be doing it right if our systems and our processes are not right inside of the church. Yeah. Okay, so meaning that we as believers, we, we should also follow the order that God has given us as the church. And, and one of the order is that we should function under the authority of the fivefold teachers, fivefold leaders. Okay, remember the church is governed by the government of the church is, is, is fivefold leaders. Okay, and all of us carry something that we have to actually take out there, wherever God is taking us, whether it's education, whether it's business, whether it's media, whether it's whatever. Okay. But that gift, we, it's, we, it's, we're supposed to be responsible to make sure that we, we govern under the accountability structure of the church so that we can flourish in our gifting. Yeah. Okay. So that's actually where we can see the fruit. If otherwise, we will not see the fruit that we are looking for. So sharing with uh, some of the things that, uh, how reformation looks like, because reformation is not a, it's not a small thing, it's actually a big thing. So 
And the big thing that we have to take it when it comes to reformation is to do it through uh, developing the kingdom culture in the sphere that God has put us in. Okay. But for us to do the culture, to impact culture, we have to know what actually makes up the culture. Okay. Because I know a lot of us sometimes we don't know what makes up the culture. Sometimes we, we just go with the flow, but we don't know what really makes up the culture. So culture is mainly formed by the core values. Okay. So if each and every company, if especially if you work in the private sector, you will see that the private sector likes to uh, write the core values. So core values are those truths that are taken as the non-negotiables. Okay, the, 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 the core values in the context of the church, we talk about the core value of love, we talk about the core value of the presence of God, the core value of uh, honor, truth, integrity. So all of those things, which are the core values, when we actually live them out, they actually become the culture. So the more you live out the values of heaven, is the more they actually become a culture. Okay. So if we do life according to the core values of the world, which is corruption or lies, th th those values, that, that are the values that are actually coming from the demonic world, and they actually form the culture of darkness. But as we need to actually move in the opposite spirit and we uh, uh, leave the cultures of heaven, the core values of heaven, so that we can form the kingdom culture. Okay? So we have to, we as the church, we, we have to be the architects, the architects of culture. Okay? So which means that each and every day, we need to be conscious that we either contribute to a culture shaped by the values of the kingdom, or we actually leave values that undermine the culture of the kingdom. So if you're in the right place and you, you act in dishonor, you are actually empowering a culture which is not of the kingdom. Okay. And then uh, also we, we need to see uh, if we do have influence in our workplace to influence the culture. Uh, you can actually, I know a lot of businesses or organizations, they do have leaders where they will say, let's have a strategic meeting or let's have a whatever planning meetings. And some of those questions, they do come up and they say, well, what do we actually live for? What are those values that define us? So we as the church, somewhere we have to actually say, let's push some of the kingdom values. Because God, I know God is going to give us some of those moments where we can actually be the voice. Okay. So, uh, if they say, what are those values? We do have the opportunity to say, no, let's, let's, let's push the, the values of honor or the values of love or the value of excellence or whatever. So, because all cultures, once it is developed, it enables the development of social norms, whether good or bad, as I already mentioned. So if the kingdom, the culture of the kingdom, is, the culture is right, it enables the kingdom to advance. Okay. So we must intentionally live to affect the thoughts, the values, and purposes of the world around by releasing the kingdom around us each and every day. So it has to be an intention, uh, something that we are intentional about each and every day. Otherwise, it's just not, not going to happen coincidentally. Okay. And we should trust God to be the cultural catalyst. And this is possible that we, when people that we serve, when people that we serve, they actually see value in us. It actually creates an open door for us to actually invade with those values of the kingdom. So what we need is not just us to be silent. Uh, we need a, a voice that is followed by the example. We cannot say we believe in something and then we do not practice it. If we say we, we, we believe in love, we, we, it needs to be seen in us that we actually believe in love. Yeah. If we say we believe in honor, we need to actually see. It must be seen in us that we actually believe in honor. And this is modeled in our relationship with the people who are for us and those who are against us. That's those situations 
that can actually prove if you really believe in those kingdom values. Uh, I was in a, uh, I was doing the assignment for helping the MBA student with uh, the projects that she was doing, and one of those, uh, the task that she was given, she was, she was supposed to evaluate uh, her organization, the organizational culture where she's working, to actually evaluate if it contributes to the profitability of the company or the downfall, and. When you evaluate uh, the aspects that make the organizational culture, it was actually a, a, a range of factors that says people should look at. And one of them was the people in management. Okay. And then they said, we can actually look at people in management to see. I remember uh, companies that have been in existence for 100 years. Uh, the, uh, let's say 200 years, there are companies that have been formed in the 18s, whatever. The people who are working for those businesses now, they don't know what were the foundational truth in those companies. So somewhere, somehow, somebody has to go out there and actually investigate as to. But when this company was formed, what are those foundational beliefs that actually the owners of those businesses believe in? And once those things are on record, the, the next generation they are able to trace and say, okay, this was uh, 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 the values that the India people lived, and then we can actually adopt them. Otherwise, the company may be struggling because it has deviated from the foundational values. So even us, if we, we put our voice out there, and the, because we know that the kingdom values they work, and when the righteous are in power, uh, the rest of the people they prosper. So we should actually aim to make sure that we put our voice out there, we influence with the right values. And those things at some point in years to come, people are going to actually adopt them, which is the next generation. As I write here, uh, the scripture says we raise the foundation for many generations. So what we do now, we should be able to carry it to the next generations. Another example, we, we do know that next month it will tell me uh, where is the Nelson Mandela lecture and there will be people who will say, come and actually share them the good values that uh, Nelson Mandela lived by. So the people are always looking for the right values from the previous generation. Okay, and we cannot also do a reformation without working with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Jesus went to heaven, but he left us with the Holy Spirit for us to partner with the Holy Spirit in how we do church and in how we do reformation. Okay, so reform, reformation is about we align things into the governmental and divine order of God through the church, but what is in operation it is actually the Holy Spirit. We meet here on Sunday, but the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So tomorrow, wherever we are, it is actually the Holy Spirit that is at work inside of us. So the operation, it is the Holy Spirit. It is through the Holy Spirit. Okay. So which means that whatever that we do in our daily life, week in, week out, we have to rely on the Spirit of Truth because we cannot interpret the world from the world from the world trends or world events. We need to actually take our clue from the spirit of truth. We say the Holy Spirit is our guide, it's our counselor, it's the spirit of truth. So we rely on him in how we make decisions and how we interpret the world around us. And it's the same thing that uh, uh, Jesus did. He was reliant on the Holy Spirit. Before he started his ministry, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, uh, it has now become our job by means of the Holy Spirit to discover God's heart where He placed us. So, wherever you work, you say, God, what is there in your heart for this place? And then we hear from the Holy Spirit, and then we actually find strategies on how we can invade yeah. that place and we can cause that transformation. And the benefit of flowing in the Holy Spirit is that we become protected from being deceived and from being inefficient because we also get to learn our boundaries. Okay. So the Holy 
Holy Spirit will say, do this or do not do this. So he functions to encourage, but he also works in a way to say, do not go there. If you read in the, uh, the book of Acts, you will see that uh, Apostle Paul was, there were moments when the Holy Spirit will say, go there. And then there were moments when he will say, do not go there. So if he violates the Holy Spirit, uh, we also see that there were actually undesirable consequences. So with the Holy Spirit in control in our lives, we, we can actually achieve more wherever God has placed us. And then uh, another key that we need to partner with, with uh, to reform the societies is there is wisdom. Okay. So we have to actually trust God to have wisdom. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10 we say that apostolic is the foundation. So Paul, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, he says, uh, he's a wise master builder. So he's not doing the work without the aspect of wisdom. He's a wise master builder. So he, we, we need to partner with wisdom in how we go about reformation, reforming the society. Okay, and another scripture which is Ephesians 3.10, we can read that one. Ephesians 3.10, he says, Ephesians 3 verse 10, says to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So the manifold wisdom is, manifold means different flavors. Okay, so this wisdom comes in different flavors. So it says it might be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So what it means is that remember the reason we are here is so that we can actually defeat the enemy on behalf of God in, in simple terms. God doesn't want to defeat the enemy himself. But us as the church if we carry wisdom wisdom is the key to reformation. How we build, we build with wisdom. Yeah. Wisdom builds the house. Yeah. So if the principalities see wisdom in us, we are actually defeating them. The principalities and powers. It says, it says uh, the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So we need to know wisdom is the principal thing in any building program of God. Therefore, the builders of God must build under the guidance and supervision of wisdom. Okay, so Isaiah 58 says, uh, we will be the repairer of the bridge. Repairer of the bridge means where Satan has invaded. There's a hole that we need to repair. Okay, remember, reformation can mean we build, we correct, we remove what is wrong, Okay, but it also says the scripture, we shall be the restorer of the path to dwell in. You go to Jeremiah 6, chapter 16 to 17 says, As for the ancient path, okay, Jeremiah says, Ask for the ancient path, ask where the good way is, and walk in it. And you will find rest for your soul. In Isaiah, he says, You shall be the restorer of the path to dwell in. You see the correlation there. Isaiah says, We shall be the restorer of the path. Jeremiah says, Ask for the ancient path. Ask where the good way is and walk in that path, and you will find rest for your souls. Okay. And wisdom. It's one of those ancient paths that we need to actually walk in. We ask it from the Lord and 
uh, here in Isaiah, he's saying we shall be the restorer of the path to dwell in, but we're also restoring for the next generation. Okay, so that that path of wisdom we walk in it, but it's also for the next generation. It's the same in the natural. Some roads were built years ago by people who are not alive. Okay, so how does wisdom look like? It's, it's not always easy to know how wisdom looks like. But uh, some of the attributes you can learn about wisdom is that wisdom is the high standard of what we do. It's okay. The, some of the attributes of wisdom are excellence, creativity, and integrity. Okay. So those are some of the uh, attributes of wisdom. Some will say wisdom is the truth applied, whatever you say it. But some of the uh, attributes is excellence, creativity, and integrity. Okay, and how excellence looks like is that it's the high standard of what we do because of who we are. Obviously, uh, the work of the Lord is not the work that is substandard. It's the work of, that is actually excellent in nature. So we represent Him with excellence because of how He does things. Nature is beautiful, so as an example. And the other aspect is that... Uh, Talking about also excellence is that a heart of excellence has no place for the poverty spirit that affects so much of what we do. Okay, so the heart of excellence has no place for the poverty spirit. So we do everything according to the glory of God, according to the grace. Remember the poverty spirit, what it does is, is one of actually the reasons for corruption. You want to keep all this wealth and all these things to yourself. Mm -hmm. and, but what you build, you build with less, you want to accumulate things for yourself. But if you build with excellence, you are actually using what has been given to you to the best of its ability and to the best of your ability. Yeah. Okay. And you know, all of those things at the end, they will give glory to the Lord. And then the other aspect is creativity. Okay. So creativity as an attribute of wisdom is not only something that we limit it to the arts or to the entertainment. Okay. It's anything that is a creative solution that the world needs. Whether it's an invention, whether it's IT, whether it's medical. Okay. So we are living in the times of what we call the fourth industrial revolution, the four IR, and the different technologies that have been actually that have been actually popping. Okay, so we as Christians, we should actually be at the forefront of that. And these are God's creations. It's just looking for people who can access them and who can steward them for His glory. But sometimes He gives them to the world because uh, He cannot just stop working. Okay, He just needs people. Some, sometimes the world is, is more dedicated, is more excellent than the Christians. That's why God will release those things to them. But we as Christians, we can actually make a bigger impact when we are the ones dwelling some of the creative solutions. Okay. So we need new sounds of music that will come from the church. We need new forms of art. We need new buildings. We need new building plans. Okay, so that's actually uh, why we need wisdom. Another aspect is integrity. Okay, and integrity is the expression of God's character that is seen in us as the church. And that character is actually holiness. Yeah. So it is important that we as Christians, we always ask for wisdom. We pray for wisdom. We do not work from all traditions that are that is actually religion. Yeah, because religion does not actually build the church. Okay. So we need to actually make sure that we seek wisdom in everything that we do. We are born to partner with it and to display God's creative solutions. Okay. All right. And then, so people who care wisdom are people who will say we can, we can have the solution for what the world actually needs. So those are the people who have wisdom. So 
when we see that there's a gap, we shall be the restorer of, uh, what is this? It says the repairer of the bridge. When we see the bridge in the society, we can actually partner with God to get wisdom on how to repair that bridge. Okay, where the enemy has invaded. Whether it's the solution on how to decrease divorce, how to raise children better, how to do business better, how to give, how to run governments better. Okay. And I know in each and every person that God has created this, this that gift and skill and ability, where it's grace. That is that we can that actually God can stay in us to be used for the kingdom. Okay. And and in one Timothy, this is one of the one Timothy two, one to four is a scripture there which says we must pray for those in authority. But let me read. It says first of all, if you are there, first of all, then I urge that the in treaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable inside of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay. So, the first step, if you do not have an idea of how you can actually start living with wisdom, or how you can start the journey of reforming wherever you are, you can actually make this your daily duty. Okay? To actually pray for those who are in authority. Okay? Remember, we pray for them, they can open their hearts to us, to our methods, to our ideas, to our solutions, and that can be a target for the invasion of God's values, God's wisdom in a given that given situation. Okay. So that's actually one of the strategies that we can actually follow. Um, prayer, this type of prayer will actually establish a climate in which people will be saved and they will come to the knowledge of the truth of the other God. Okay. And then when I say that uh, excellence is about the holiness of God, and uh, to give a, a brief overview of what holiness is, holiness means we, we have to be holy without spot or blemish and set apart exclusively for God. If you are transformed and you want to, for you to be the reformer, you yourself, you have to be transformed. Okay. So if God has to trust you with, to be the reformer, you have to be set apart for him before you can be the reformer. So you have to be set apart for God. Otherwise, somewhere along the line, you are going to be compromised. Okay, that's, that's the truth. So meaning that we will never radically reform and transform our nations without personal holiness. So meaning that our passions should extend our efforts to bring a culture of holiness in the daily life of our nation. And holiness is not an option because we are commanded. Yeah. God says we need to be holy so that we can see the Lord. Okay. And uh, another strategy that uh, God is using to reform our nation is we need to know that when we say you are, you are operating with wisdom, it looks a little bit subtle. So there are times where, let me uh, use pastor's ways, the overt and the, the overt and the covert. So sometimes we are more like children in how we do things. We trust God, we pray in secret, mm -hmm. and we say, Lord, please change the heart of this person. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when we approach things, we approach them in the spirit with violence. It's the militant approach to reformation. Okay. So sometimes people are going to be involved in those warfare prayers where we are violent and the violent take it by force. Okay. So in uh, 
When we did the service on the seven mountains, we spoke about that each and every mountain, it has the principality. So the principality has to be what removed. So the aspect of reformation is removed. We take what is already ours. So those principalities are actually occupying the spaces that do not belong to them. Because when the Israelites were given the promised land, uh, God told them that the, the land that they are going into, it has giants. So those giants did not belong there. Okay. So the New Testament says from the days of the John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. That is the New Testament. Old Testament Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 12, 20 verse 17, it says to the Israelites, God says, but you shall utterly destroy them. Okay. The Hittites and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Perizzite and the Hevite and the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded. So somewhere in our lives, some people are going to be involved in the militant approach where we have to destroy the principalities. Okay. We know Elijah was involved in a battle with the false prophets. There was a militant approach to reformation. So in this case, we remove principalities from a position occupied by working the promise, not sitting. So we, we work the promise. Okay. But we have to do it with the anointing, the authority, and agenda. Remember I said, when you also engage in this type of battle, it means we have the gift and whatever that you do, it has to be submitted under the accountability structures of the church. Yes. Okay. And what we have to know is that the kingdom is advancing forcefully. So this is what is happening right now. The kingdom of God is advancing forcefully. Mm. And we have to be part of that force. It's, it's like a military force. We need to be part of that military force. That continues to storm the strongholds, where we target the strongholds of the enemy. So it doesn't matter, the world may be against us, but we are able to effectively advance the kingdom because greater is God who is in us than what is actually around us. Okay. And it doesn't matter whether you go through opposition or affliction, but we have been actually trained to overcome because the, uh, the way in 1 John 4 verse 4 it says we actually overcame the world. And you go and you read uh, Revelations, it way actually uh, Jesus wrote to the seven churches. You actually get the models of how some of the churches, some of the things that the churches deal with. All right. And uh, one of the things that I want to share, which is actually very key to the Reformation, is about the finances. Okay. So the New Testament church is a sending church. Reformation goes when we go out there. Okay, it's a sending church and you cannot send or you cannot go without resources and without finances. Okay. And the church is the one that should actually have generate resources and carry those resources. So the, and there have been actually prophecies that the the wealth of the wicked will be transferred to the to the righteous. It has been prophesied. So the question now is whether we as the church, are we actually ready for it? So God expects us as the church, the New Testament church, to be the first fruit of economic breakthroughs yes. in each and every region. Remember I said, we are the governing church. So when you are the governing church, given the structure that we have in the spirit, you should be able to actually uh, be the pioneer of certain things that actually the world cannot even access. Yeah. Okay. So the church has to prove to the skeptics and to the people around and unbelievers that those principles of economics, they are actually true, that are actually recorded in the Bible, they, they actually work. Okay. The same way that Joseph did in, 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 the, in Genesis when actually he went into a, what's that, drought or recession, whatever you call it. Okay. So we need to demonstrate that uh, the fish and the bread that Jesus used, they can actually feed the multitudes. That's actually what the church has to, to demonstrate. Which links to the scripture which says, uh, the manifold wisdom of God has to be displayed to the principalities and to the powers. 
Remember those principalities, the, the devil has placed them in people in the world. Okay. So when we impact people, but in, in the spirit, the principalities and powers, you can actually see that he, uh, the kingdom of God is actually advancing and is actually making an impact. So we need to be ready as the church to, to we need to be ready for the great transfer of wealth. And it's about actually uh, sticking to the basics. You tithe, you go about beyond the tithing. Because tithing is actually it's like a tax, cost taxation. And then going beyond the tithe is about the harvest, the sowing the seed. But you cannot have the harvest when you don't sow the seed. Okay. And actually God wants us to sow the seed because he wants to raise the, the Josephs. Who will mobilize and empower people to a place that is beyond self-sufficiency. We need to be self-sufficient so that the church can go out there to the world and to actually cause that transformation. Okay. Thank you. And let's pray as I close off. And thank you, Lord, that uh, we can meet today and to share the message about your heart to reform the society. We thank you, Lord, that you will transform our hearts to be reformers who are trained, who are accountable, who are in submission, who are bold, who are able to go out there, Lord, to, to engage the enemy and to partner with wisdom to live out the values of the kingdom where you have placed us. We thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit remind us in each and every day of our lives that uh, we can make a difference and we can be part of the military force that is advancing the kingdom. Thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.